Well, Jane, I am so excited that you're here. You get to join me on stage. Um, and you, we, we heard a little bit about personalization um, in the beauty industry. But I think many people here in the room, when you, when you think of Estee Lauder, AI typically isn't always the top of the <laughs> list, right? But I know you're doing so much stuff with technology. Can you explain a little bit about where you feel AI beauty kind of intersect right now? Yeah, so I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, I think that people don't normally think about a legacy company like Estee Lauder as uh, focused on technology. But just to kind of give you a, a sense, the company was started over 75 years ago by my grandmother, Estee Lauder. And at the time, she was the original woman in STEM. She was mixing up creams on her stove with her chemist uncle. Fast forward to today, you know, uh, R&D technology drives all of our amazing products. And so it is so much a part of our company about using technology to drive um, beauty. And really, beauty is one of the most personal categories, and personalization is driven by data. So that's how we bring AI into this whole equation. So let me, let me, let me pull something out here for the audience, because I think when you think of AI and think of what your industry is, you know, the steps to integrate technology, even with a legacy company, is not always easy. What are some steps that you would share that you know, the people in the room can maybe say, hey, this is how we should start thinking about things, or things that maybe you have done too that's helped integrate? Yeah, so you know, one of the things I've, I've done is spend a lot of time looking at and spending time with other companies outside of beauty, in other consumer goods, but really across the world to be able to understand what they're doing and how they're integrating AI. And I'd say they're kind of five takeaways. I would call them the, the five T's. The first one is creating a task force because AI is going to impact everything within your company and you need to bring everybody together or else it could be like a free for all. The other one is trust, um, you know, data and, and making sure our data is trusted and protected is the most important thing for any company. So setting that up from the beginning, um, making sure that you have uh, the right talent. So, you know, people that are know what they're doing and also willing and able to get in there. Training, not just of the people using it, but senior leaders so that they actually know the right questions to ask. And finally, trial. You know, a lot of it is about um, trying different things. And, you know, the, the speaker who's here before said, you know, you're going to fail a lot of times, but keep trying, learn, and adapt. So there's two points she said in there, and I'm going to share. Hopefully she's okay with me sharing this, <laughs> um, that stood out. So we were having breakfast, and two things really stood out of the five that you said. We talked about trust and cybersecurity. I don't know, you know, when your grandmother started the company, with cybersecurity was a, was a term, but you are really focused on that. Like, why... How are you looking at that when you're partnering with companies or in the future of companies, when these companies are starting to build? What, what stands out to you? Yeah, so, you know, I think uh, for us, there, uh, um, you know, someone said to me early in my career, what is the one thing that you can't fake and you can't buy? And that's trust. And you think about that trust with the consumer in everything you do. And so for us, protecting our data, protecting the consumer, no, having them know that they have trust in us is, is the most important thing, and you can never lose that. So when we're working with companies, we want to find companies, large companies who put trust and the way that they're protecting our data at the forefront. So everything we do is you know, making sure it's protected. In a walled garden, we use enterprise systems versus open um, you know, GPT. We, we make sure that we know how it's being used, how it's being used to train different models, and that it's really protected for us. I wanted you all to get a sense of that because it is very detailed in what, how she and the, the team is looking at to it. And also, you know, since we're talking about AI, I think some of the challenges and the things that you face, you know, biases, right? I think, you know, for me, you think of AI, you think of the beauty industry as well, and then you think of bias. How are you looking at all that combined? Because it is a big, big, um, not just project, but something I know you strive for. Yeah, I think, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about bias and AI and in, you know, the beauty industry, because let's, let's face it, you know, the beauty industry, there is human bias that we've seen for years and we've been trying to break that down. But AI is, you know, we think about it, AI, it doesn't have feelings. It's not personal. It's not, it's not human yet. Um, so it's all about what we teach it and what, we, what data we put into the system. And so that's where it becomes AI with human intelligence, really constantly creating that 
way of making sure whatever we're putting into it is um, about beauty and all the different types of beauty. It's actually interesting. Um, I knew we were going to talk about this. So last night I, I did another check. I went on to ChatGPT and I said, you know, what is, give me some pictures or what is view of beauty? And it was great. It actually really answered that, you know, there's so many different types of human beauty and it's very diverse. And I was like, okay, it's learning or we're doing a good job of inputting better um, information. I mean, I think that's something that you all over there make a big effort to do so, right? Especially with the, the, the things. How many companies are underneath the, underneath the brand company? Can you we tell have over, We have over 20 brands. And so people don't really think about that. That's the Estee Lauder companies. But, you know, we have everything from Mac, which is probably our most diverse um, set of consumers, um, you know, Clinique, Creme de la Mer, Tom Ford, uh, you know, just a wide variety of brands. And each one is unique and different and has a unique and different consumer group. And so we have to make sure that whatever we're doing caters to those different consumers. So I asked her, is there anything that could help this thing? <laughs> and she's like, no. No, no, she didn't say that. <laughs> no, she asked, you know, it was funny because um, I didn't expect this, and that's why I think how much she cares about that. She asked me, she was grilling me, like I was the one being interviewed, of all these questions, and I think it shows the case of, of, of the skin tone and to that degree. Can you, I mean, I know we, I didn't plan, you know. No, 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 I know. Well, I, I, started ask, I started asking him um, questions because that's how we have always been creating, um, you know, the experiences for our consumers. So this is what's really important is that at our company, there are two things that, that make the difference. Obviously, it's high performance, incredible quality products, but it's also the being able to use the right products for you, the right personal experience. And so those go hand in hand, and that's what we talk about is high touch. So it started off with my grandmother behind the counter talking to someone, asking them about their skin, to today we have virtual try-on tools all being um, ingested with all the questions that, we, that she would ask, meaning what's your lifestyle, how often do you travel, what, you know, what, tell me about your skin, tell me about the different things that concern you or that you want. What, what are your skin goals? And, you know, that's how we're going to find, Ryan, the perfect combination. She asked products. me all this. I was flustered. <laughs> I don't know what to answer. I was like, can you just give me one thing? And she said, nope. We, want, we <laughs> wanted to be personalized. And I think that means a lot because I don't think we see that from an external, how much effort that goes into it. But you were talking about your grandmother, too. I, I think of legacy and history. Mm -hmm. I also think people don't see the, well, we know that the beauty industry is highly evolving that you need to be adapting and, 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 and be very nimble. I think mm -hmm. it's super clear that consumers are moving at a fast pace. How do you balance that still today? Yeah, so one of the things that I'm really excited about with the change, especially with generative AI, is that over the past 25 years, um, the pace of change in technology has been huge, and companies that were digital natives had an advantage over legacy heritage companies. They could move faster, they were vertically integrated, but now the script has flipped. It's actually the companies with the most amount of proprietary data and the knowledge of how to use it actually have the competitive advantage. So we have a company that has over 75 years of data across hundreds of millions of consumers, thousands of formulas and ingredients that we've been collecting and integrating, and now that's how AI you know, gets smarter. It's by ingesting proprietary data with the world's greatest data to come up with the new and the innovative and what's next. And so I'm kind of excited. It's a legacy company. We're actually at an advantage in the tech space for once. <laughs> at once. For once, yeah. You know, I, and I think of, you know, and, and while I was thinking of that question, I think, you know, as many people in the room has faced challenges with their own businesses, with their own careers, I think one I would ask you, what is a challenge that you are facing right now as a company that you feel like you want to continue to build on but to make better that, you know, is on, on everyone's, you know, it's one of the goals, I guess, of, of your forefront. Yeah, and I think especially when we're thinking about tech and AI, there is vast amounts of data, but making sure that you can connect it in the right way mm. and feed it into the algorithms and keep testing it in the right way is a challenge because it's not like you just you know, flip the switch. You all know that, but you know, when you're trying to explain AI and data to beauty executives who, who don't actually know what we're talking about, they just want to turn on 
the faucet and get the water. They actually don't want to know that the pipes are corroded in this area and that we need to fix this. They're like, I just, I, I just I went would, to work. I would pay to watch someone <laughs> explain to the beauty, like you explaining yeah. it to them and see how people interact. Is that, actually, you want to stay there for a second because I'm sure many people here who are in the tech world having to explain to their clients or subcontractors or whatever, and there's a disconnect. Any advice to that? Yeah, I mean, I think, so for me, I'm, I'm not a tech person. I didn't grow up in tech. I grew up running brands and being head of brands and head of marketing for 24 years. And I moved into this space four years ago. And part but of- But you know, I mean, you know your stuff. I right, would well, have to because, say. Because in order to know how to solve a problem, you need to know how things work. And so knowing how, how every part of our company works, knowing how we make products, et cetera, then technology can come in and make it better, faster, um, smarter, and that's, I think, you have to have that combination. So how would, you, how would you deal with somebody that, in the boardrooms, not your boardrooms, mm -hmm. but in general, an investor or mm -hmm. a board director or someone who doesn't understand your business or understand mm -hmm. tech, is there a skill technique that you well, would one of the Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things we do internally, which I, I recommend that everybody does in their company, is we actually have um, reverse mentors, and it was something our CEO started you know, 15 years ago, which is every senior executive is paired with a junior person who, you know, presumably people who are young starting out in their career are more digitally native savvy. and savvy. And so we're partnered together and you have those people. So you learn from each other. You learn, you know, the, the junior person gets to learn from the senior person and spend time with them. But then the senior person says this person, you know, this junior person really has a voice, knows what's happening, and is going to help train me on things like. So we just did a huge session on training everyone around how to use enterprise GPT and, and Microsoft Copilot. So they're all training them now because it starts from the top. You don't change a business, you don't change a culture unless it starts from the top. I, I love that idea. I don't know if anyone wrote that one. That was, that's a good, <laughs> good pol that's a good policy for any level, even if you're a startup, you know, and even if you're, you know. Growing. So, but even if you're a startup, you can say to a legacy company, hey, we want to come in and be your reverse mentor too. You know, people are looking for advice. People are looking for help. And, um, you know, offering that is, is important. Um, what would be, so we've got a few minutes left, mm -hmm. and I'm going to play this game, which she doesn't know. She knows it's coming, but she doesn't know exactly the questions. So mm -hmm. Ryan is curious. <laughs> um, lightning round kind of way. Your favorite, your favorite job that you had have had, or or let me let me take a step back because you've had some great jobs at SS at Lauder within the thing. Maybe is there a theme of a, a job that you keep taking that stands out to you that's been favorite to you? Yeah, so I I knew he was going to probe in this area, and I said, you know, it was it was hard to explain, but um, I love to solve problems, and I like to go and take the the hard um, assignments. I know that <laughs> that's, that's crazy. But it's I think, crazy. It's but crazy. Not too but crazy, it's always, not crazy to this crowd because always, they like hard assignments. It's the same thing. I mean, I think in tech, you like to solve the problem. The, the harder the problem, the more exciting it is. And the more, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, job satisfaction you get. And so I've always taken jobs that are either a brand that's in turnaround, um, you know, the whole AI. Um, transformation for our company, the whole digital transformation, how are we going to take a company that, that is a legacy luxury company and bring it into a world that is, you know, changing all of media, digital, how we do um, consumer interactions. And so for me, it's always about going after those things that are the hardest problems and then finding out solutions. Best career advice. Best career advice. So I was given this by one of our board of directors, um, which I now share with everybody, is to put aside two hours a week for learning. And not meaning like learning in a class, but meaning going to conferences like this, hearing from other executives, you know, connecting with people. I think one of the things that you don't realize, and, and I did this a lot during COVID, was reaching out to other companies, people that are, have your title in other companies, and sharing advice, and people are so open to that, they want to hear from you, but just do it. I mean, you're, you're so, everyone's so nervous to reach out to people, but um, especially I'm, I'm an introvert, so it's hard, but. Uh, I, I have to <laughs> highlight that. Did you guys, do you all hear what she just said? I'm gonna repeat it. It's so important, I've, 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 we've talked to a lot of people. Just what? 
reach out to somebody. Reach out, yeah. Drop a note, drop an educational note. <laughs> Don't just, you know, copy and paste, right? Yeah. That would catch anyone. Yeah, and go up to people at conferences and introduce yourself because, um, you know, it's, it's intimidating, but... Uh, I, I would say, I, I, she's much nicer, I would say do your homework on the person and make sure you <laughs> okay, know right, so. what, what you're, you're, you're doing. But I think that's, I mean, for coming from you, that's, I think it's inspiring to hear that, you know, you're very down to earth, but also care about those problems as well. Um, what do you think, um, in a couple of sentences, how do you answer this? The future of AI in five years in the beauty industry is what? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, one of the things I think that um, I've learned as I've been in this space, and, I, you know, there's, there's, um, there's a couple, three lessons that I, that I tell my team. One is that um, AI is not, um, you know, incremental, it's exponential. Hmm. The second one is it's about the data and the right people being able to use the data that it's going to make the difference. And the third is that absolutely no one knows what the future holds in AI and everyone's learning as they go. And I think it's a, it's a very different time because, you know, yes, there are people who are more expert, but not really. So when you think about what the future holds, the future is, you know, us to shape in this AI journey and, and thinking about how to use it to drive your business. Well, I'm breaking my own rules because I want to yeah. ask you quicker questions, but you said something that was interesting about people and finding the right talent and finding the people who understand these things. Um, I know we kind of had a conversation briefly, but mm -hmm. you, can you share a little bit of like how you're doing that or what you're, you're, you're pretty much leading the voice of trying to get more, you know, analysts, data analysts in your ecosystem? Yeah, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm a huge believer that this is all about talent. The future of any great business is the right talent, the right skills, the right, right capabilities, and we're all going to be um, you know, recruiting and fighting for the best talent in data and data science and, and technology. And so for me, that is a passion point. And I'm also passionate about having um, women in data and having them want to come to our company and, you know, recruiting talent. I come to conferences because I, you know, hopefully I will leave and you'll be like, wow, I want to work at Estee Lauder because it's a great place for people in technology, but also women in technology. And I, I was sharing with Ryan that only... Um, one in eight C-suite people that are in tech are women. And so it's a, it's a, it's a big opportunity for the future. And, and we started actually um, recruiting at the right out of college for people in data science and going because, you know, you go to universities and I went to Stanford and, and you go and, and you talk to people and everyone there wants to go and work for a big tech company, but you don't realize that there's so many more opportunities for them. And so we're, we're, we have a data and analytics rotational program that we just started and, you know, it starts by recruiting great people and, and sharing as a woman in technology, you have so many choices. I think as one of the leaders that I've been following you for a very long time and getting to see all the things you're, you're doing, like you're very genuine and you're actually to the, trying to make that impact, which I know we're all excited to see that because we need it, especially when it comes to innovation. All right, two more things and we, we, we will wrap <laughs> yes. up. You ready? Yes. Okay. Okay, now I want one word. Can you do one word? I'll give you a sentence. Maybe if they like you, they'll give you a sentence. The future of Estee Lauder is? Innovation. Ooh, that's a good one. Now you want to know more, right? I do. <laughs> I do. I do. But I break one my word, and then no. you, yeah. And then I would say, um, man, that was good. I didn't think that you would go that route. Um, well, then I would say the, the future, okay, since we were talking about what is the future of, what is the future of beauty in one word? Personalization. So I, 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 I think of those two things. I think of how, how evolved the industry has, has come and the fact that you've spent some time with us and sharing your thoughts. You know, I, I, we appreciate it. Um, and then I'll leave it on this note. What is one other piece of kind of advice that you would say to people starting their careers that, um, that looking into other industries that you would leave to them when it comes to technology? How would you, how would you face technology? How would you face it? Um, you mean in, in terms of starting your career yeah. in technology? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, I think I'd go to a place that um, I always tell people it's never about the job. It's about the boss. And so it doesn't actually matter which job you take as long as the boss is there, someone who's going to teach you, train you, develop you, and support you. And that's the best advice I can give. I love that. We'll end on that note. So thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you.